The toolbox of US Marine breachers is as versatile as it gets. That said, urban breaching is not just about blowing things up. Deciding which method to use depends on many factors, like how quickly the team needs to get inside the building. If they're positive that the inside is 100% hostile, the amount of time they can spend standing out in the open, and whether or not there are any hostages. But why Marines hold their weapons upside down when breaching doors? How breachers can replace half of their explosive charge with a bag of water and still accomplish the same result? Why after blowing a hole in a concrete wall, breachers sometimes rush toward it with a mechanical saw? And what's the number one mistake that will get you kicked out of breacher school? It's not what you think. There are five pillars to urban breaching. Manual, mechanical, thermal, ballistic, and explosive. So let's kick things off. The most common technique for manual breaching is a kick close to the locking mechanism of a door, which could potentially open a residential door. Mechanical tools like a sledgehammer or battering ram could help generate more force. But they can't open all types of doors. For example, the doors on commercial buildings are unlikely to be opened by a battering ram, no matter how much you try. Even if you get help, it still won't work, because those doors typically open outward, not inward. In those scenarios, a halogen bar or a hydraulic tool could be leveraged to force the door open. But why not cut a hole through the door when you got a circular saw in your hands? Now, I'm not an expert, but the hardest part of breaching a door with a circular saw doesn't seem to be the actual cutting. Rather, it's getting the saw started. Exhibit A. Moving on to thermal breaching, which is probably one of the slowest methods to cut down metal doors. Now, you might be thinking it's the actual process of thermal cutting that's time-consuming. But no, that's the fast part. The time-consuming part is igniting the thermal rod. Because if you need to use a circular saw to ignite the thermal rod, and considering how long it can take to start the circular saw, exhibit B, yeah, you get the idea. But kidding aside, thermal breaching is indeed one of the least common techniques for cutting doors, because it's relatively slow and involves using heavy and bulky equipment. That said, there are lightweight and portable tools like the Tech Torch, which is quick, easy to carry around, and can even be operated from a distance. Tech Torch works by shooting out a metal vapor jet with a temperature of 5000 degrees Fahrenheit at a velocity of about 330 feet per second. So it can cut metal pretty easily, but it uses cartridges that only last for a couple of seconds, which makes it suitable for cutting through a lock. But to cut a large opening in a door with a tech torch, a breacher would need to burn through quite a few cartridges. Ballistic breaching is one of the fastest ways to breach a door. And shotguns are the most popular tool for this job. Some even call them the master key. Depending on the situation, the breacher might target the door latch and lock. Because a single shot could potentially get the door unlocked. Another approach is to go for the hinges, which takes more shots and could also be a little more tricky, since hinges are not visible from the outside. But why do breachers hold their guns upside down? Breachers are trained to shoot 45 degrees down and 45 degrees into the door jam. This is to minimize the risk to any occupants that might be inside the room. The thing is, holding a gun in that particular angle means that they sometimes need to adjust their grip, which could result in holding the gun upside down or in other unusual manners. But if none of these techniques are suitable for the job, that's when the breachers bring out their boombox. Detonation cord, commonly referred to as dead cord, is the building block of any explosive charge. Dead cord is made up of high explosives wrapped in a waterproof plastic coating. It's basically a high-speed fuse, but instead of burning, it explodes. 
Well, that was pretty cool. What's even more cool is that since dead cord is not a sensitive explosive, it can be safely cut into pieces. That said, the open end of the dead cord needs to be taped up. And there's a so good reason that, for it. Keep this shit in. See this, see this stuff? It'll, okay, okay. it'll fall out. So we're going to put some tape on it to keep it from falling out. Not that I recommend. But even if you were to hit a piece of dead cord with a hammer or throw it in fire, it won't explode. The only thing that would set it off is a strong shock wave. With that said, the simplest type of explosive charge that breachers use is made by cutting one or more pieces of dead cord and placing them tightly on a double-sided tape. The charge is then sealed off with another piece of tape and there you have it, a dead cord linear charge, which is light, can be rolled and easily carried around. The linear charge is then carefully placed on the door with the help of a double-sided tape known as breacher's tape. For the best results, the charge needs to lie flush against the surface. The blast from the charge cuts the door, and if it's placed on the lock side, the detonation will swing the door open. The linear charge can also be placed in the middle of the door or near the hinges. Regardless of placement, the door will either fall down or get blown away. Did you notice that piece of fragment flying outward? The linear charge is quite forgiving as to the exact placement, while still achieving the desired results. I said forgiving, not foolproof. Also, it doesn't work too well on stronger metal doors, and that's where the water bags come into play. A water impulse charge is primarily used on metal doors, and in contrast to linear charges which try to cut through the door, water charges are placed in the center of the door and generate a strong push effect that can blow the door off its hinges. Breachers make water charges by taking a piece of dead cord and wrapping it tightly into a loop. This coil of dead cord is then sandwiched between two water bags, which are simply plastic water containers. Everything is then wrapped tightly with duct tape. But what's up with the water bags? These two water bags play two different roles in a water charge detonation. If you've ever belly flopped into a pool, you know that hitting water, even at relatively low speeds, can really hurt. But at extremely high speeds, hitting water is not much different than hitting concrete. In a water charge setup, the bag that's placed in front of the explosive is called a buffer. When the charge explodes, the blast pushes the water at extremely high speeds toward the door. To the door, the effect is not much different than being hit by a fast-moving piece of concrete. It's this hydraulic pressure that buckles the center of the door and rips the entire door from the frame. But if it's the buffer that turns the blast into a push, What's the second water bag for? This is what a typical marine breaching team looks like. This is the breacher, the person who leads the team, but also primes the charge with the help of a blasting cap or a loop of dead cord. He's also the person who detonates the charge. This is the assistant breacher. His job is to help the breacher prepare and place the explosive charge on the target and then spool out the wire. This is the blanket man, whose job is to hold the ballistic breaching blanket that protects the marines behind him. The guys at the end are the assault force, and after the charge goes off, they are the ones who would enter the building first. Now, the whole team could stand really far back to stay safe from blast overpressure and fragmentation from the explosion. But that means it would take longer for the assault force to enter the building and a few seconds could make a huge difference if they intend to surprise the hostile forces that are inside. So the team needs to minimize the distance while staying relatively safe. That distance is called the minimum safe distance. To reduce the minimum safe distance, breaching teams adjust their position so they're not standing directly in front of the explosive charge. They rather stay off axis to one side and sometimes even around the corner. 
Displacement makes it technically possible to perform explosive breaching when a blast blanket is not available. However, using a blanket allows the team to stand closer to the charge, which reduces the minimum safe distance. Now, this is where the second water bag, which is called the tamper, comes into the picture. Tampers increase the effectiveness of the charge by directing the blast back toward the door. This may seem trivial, but get this. By adding a tamper, breachers could cut the amount of explosives needed in half and still get the same result. But since less explosives means a reduction in blast overpressure, using tampers can shorten the minimum safe distance even more, which means faster entry into the building. Water charges are compact and quite effective, but the water bags add to the overall weight of the charge, and so double-sided tape alone may not keep the charge stuck to the door. This is why a bridle is added to the water charge during its assembly. Once at the breach site, a prop stick is placed under the bridle to hold some of the weight. The downside to this is that the prop stick itself could turn into a projectile and cause injury. This is why all the safety protocols have to be taken into account before a charge is detonated or a shotgun is fired. In fact, negligent discharge is the number one mistake that would earn a student an instant drop from the breacher's course. Okay. Take it off safe, place it. Hey, 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 slow down, down. What did you do wrong? You didn't wait for me yeah, to yeah. get in the knob. Oh, fuck. Play Sometimes the best way to get in is not through the door. For example, if there are suspicions that the door is booby-trapped, or when the team really wants to surprise those who are inside the building. The solution is to create a new opening in the wall or the roof. And that's what the oval charge, also known as silhouette charge, is used for. The oval charge needs a large backing material, where multiple long pieces of dead cord are tightly attached all around. The stronger the wall, the more dead cord is added. Then everything is secured in place with duct tape. Because this type of charge is quite large, a spot is added on the back for a prop stick. The oval charge is then placed on the wall and secured in place. The result is an opening in the wall large enough for the assault team to go through. That said, oval charges are kind of bulky for transport, and since they're placed on walls and roofs, they could possibly damage something like a gas line and risk the success of the entire operation. Speaking of risk, notice how before this oval charge goes off, someone throws in a piece of wood. There it is. That, my friends, was a futile attempt to save a life. But it was already too late. Let's roll it back. What happens is that moments before the detonation, a snake crawls toward the door. The guys behind the camera notice it and try to get the snake's attention by tossing in a piece of wood. But the snake doesn't notice and continues crawling in through the side of the door, having no idea that a big surprise is about to blow up in its face. As the Marines investigated the area, they concluded that at the time of the accident, the snake was testing the pass-through mode on the latest virtual reality headset. The next two types of explosive charges are both placed around doorknobs. This is a donut charge. Breachers make donut charges by using two pieces of dead cord and wrapping one around the other in order to form a Yuli knot. Then another piece of tape is used to add a sliding tape knot on the open ends on the charge. The sliding knot is used to secure the charge around doorknobs. I should note that any explosive charge has a tag attached to it. This tag is created by the person who builds the explosive, and what they write on it includes information like the date built, name of the builder, minimum safe distance, the type of the charge, and its net explosive weight. Ah, I guess that's what the crayons are for. To make a C charge, breachers cut and place dead cord in the shape of the letter C on a piece of cardboard. 
The amount of debt court used depends on the type of door to be breached. Then everything is taped up. The last step is to cut the center of the cardboard, forming a star. This creates an opening so that the C-charge can be easily placed on a doorknob. What remains is the pull of the trigger to do the trick. But looking at it in slow motion, did you notice that bright light? The shock tube is a fuse that transports the initial signal to an explosive by means of a shock wave. It's usually a longer cable that gets attached to the explosive. The shock wave inside a shock tube moves at about half the speed as the shock wave inside a dead cord. A Uli knot slider charge is made up of a long piece of dead cord with three Uli knots on it, which can freely slide on the dead cord. This type of charge is typically used to blow out the three hinges on a door, with its main advantage being that each charge body can be slided up or down so it can be easily adjusted at the target to be able to compensate for different hinge placements. That said, Yuli knots are also incorporated when making probably the most powerful urban breaching charge, the concrete charge. In contrast to all the explosive charges, which either use the cut or push technique, concrete charges use the blast principle to breach concrete up to 19 inches thick. Typically, each block of composition C4 is taped to the Uli knots. It's safe to say that anyone on the other side of this charge would be indefinitely non-functional. But with all its power, this charge cannot cut the rebar that's inside reinforced concrete. And so it's not unusual to see a breacher with a circular saw walking toward a concrete wall after a blast. When it comes to breaching, probably the most elite group is US Marine Security Forces Recapture Tactics Team. To make it into this highly specialized group, Marines first need to undergo the Infantry Training Battalion course, then the Basic Security Guards course. After being assigned to a unit, the tryouts begin, where they look at each candidate's character, marksmanship and other skills. Next, they need to qualify to join the CQB, or Close Quarters Battle Force, where less than 100 Marines and Sailors get through each year. And after some more reassessments, a small number of them make it into the Recapture Tactics team, like the one that guards the Naval Submarine Base at Kings Bay, Georgia, because that's the sort of qualifications you need when your job is to guard the most powerful naval weapons on the face of the Earth.